Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. And for those of you who are with us this morning, you can probably doze off for a couple of minutes because you've heard a lot of this before. Um, welcome to today's uh, Global Forum um, and Scotsoft 2015. A couple of housekeeping points. Um, anybody need to use the toilets? Back down to reception and to your right. Telephones. It was great. In the developer conference this morning, nobody's phone went off. So could we emulate that and please turn your phones to silent? Anybody who misses out on that one, if the phone goes, I'm going to charge you 50 quid to go to a charity of my choice. We're not planning a fire alarm this afternoon, so if the fire alarms go off, please vacate in an orderly manner through those doors that way, and I think also this way. So that's the housekeeping out of the way. Um, we wouldn't be able to make an event like this happen without a lot of support from a lot of people from you for coming along, thank you very much. Um, without you, it's pretty meaningless. To our speakers who have flown in from various parts of the world, um, who we very much thank for having done so, and to our sponsors who help us make this work financially. Um, so I'd particularly like to thank this afternoon's sponsors, IFB, Comms World, City Fibre, a bit of a comms fl flavor going through all of this, and Fangio. Um, and before I pass on to uh, the speakers for this afternoon, I hope you're very much going to enjoy this afternoon. I think we've got a great lineup. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Graham Gordon, who of our keynote sponsors, IFB, to come up and say a few words. Graham. So when we heard that there was a great idea to get a, a room full of developers together, uh, and start on time and finish on time. That was going to end in a disaster, let's face it, right from day one. And we knew that all the developers were going to uh, obviously blame the, blame the project managers. But it's turned out great. Uh, thanks very much for turning up today. This morning shows the, the breadth and the depth, the real depth of the software industry and the development industry here in Scotland. Um, we don't big ourselves up enough. We do it enough to ourselves. That's why these events are so well attended. But from our point of view, uh, really should we be telling more people more of the time about how great we are and we are great at what we do most of the time and when we get it wrong we improve from from our point of view the developers conference this morning really was about inspire learn and play um, which was really quite interesting as a theme the, the, the interactive areas out here where you see some of the technology that is out there really is all about future gazing and making things happen not just now not in the past but how do we move forward? How do your businesses and your clients' businesses really take advantage of what's coming in the future? And we are, really are, leading that edge just now as a business and as an organization. So we've been encouraged to think big, um, but today, you know, line code starts small. Some of the, the best ideas are, are quite small ones. And how do, you, do, we, do we collaborate, collaborate uh, and move those small ideas into really big ones? Well, you can do all the social media uh, reference that you want about how much video is being updated and. How do you make that real? Um, the future is in the palm of our hands. Mobility is a massive thing. We all know that. But what are we doing about it? And, and which audience are we trying to capture by doing that? So I know I don't look old enough, but I have a 16-year-old daughter. And this is her messages and her photos sent on WhatsApp in one year. One, one app. You, what does she do with the rest of her time? But <laughs> one app. These messages, this volume of uh, images, one gig of data. So big data is not just made up of chunky, massive bits of data. It's made up of massive amounts of small data like this. Because if you can read into this, if you can read the emotion and the sentiment and the joy and the happiness and the distress that are in within these messages, they're not all hair pushing out, by the way. There's lots of strings in here, believe me. What can you do as a business? How does that enable our industry to benefit other industries, if you can use this massive amount of small data to the benefit of everything else that's going around us. But just not, and that's the generation that's coming and is here. You know, the, the, at 16, she's within five or six years of being at university. She's in, within two or three years of being employable. She still doesn't tidy her bedroom, which is a different thing. But let's not think about just the 16 year olds. Let's think about age at all shapes and sizes. Uh, I threw this picture of Daniel Craig in here just to keep Karen happy. Uh, but also the, <laughs> but also the, and possibly Polly, but the quote about age uh, uh, not being a guarantee uh, of knowledge uh, and youth not being a guarantee of innovation is really relevant. And it comes from James Bond, the old dog meeting the new, the new guy with a new box of tricks. We have got a proven box of tricks that we're continually astounding the market with. Let's do more of that as we move forward. 
And quite creepily, this is the creepy bit we get to, I took this photograph uh, in Marks and Spencers of these um, not too young uh, ladies who were planning their holiday between the two of them completely online. And you will, well, what's new about that? They were flicking messages back and forth. They were using the internet to book a meal in Miami that we're going on holiday with, without their husbands, I hasten to add. And they were doing it, sitting in Marks and Spencers, having a lovely cup of coffee and a sandwich. So don't discount age when we're thinking about innovation, because there's a lot of us in the room that are not 21, uh, and we can really benefit those in the room who are 21. Think about yourselves and your clients as a center of data and the technology that's sitting in the room behind us is just a medium, it's just a bit of hardware. It means nothing and it does nothing unless you apply knowledge and expertise and intelligence to the data that's been captured. And that's the really important bit. That's what we do as an industry and what we should be moving forward with as we do move forward. And that's something that I hope you will take away from today. So a fantastic afternoon of speakers. Uh, I've had the privilege of chatting to a couple this afternoon already. Uh, you're in for a great lineup. Um, my job is to introduce the MC for this afternoon, and I thought she was going to be straight out of Compton, but actually she's not. It's Kay Adams from, from the BBC and other ventures that are out there, and she's going to be compiling this afternoon and introducing the panel. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you very much indeed, Graham. Uh, great slides, by the way, not a bar, char uh, bar chart in sight, which is always very nice. Though I have to say, taking pictures surreptitiously of old ladies and Marks and Spencers is very creepy, and <laughs> you were lucky not to be arrested, but there you go. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here this afternoon, and to be honest, uh, to get a small window on your world, and I say that really uh, very sincerely. As somebody who spent uh, most of my career in what I suppose I have to call now old media, very reluctantly. Um, it does feel slightly as if I've drawn up at a Ferrari convention in a horse and cart, um, but I am trying not to be bitter. Um, really, the level of talent on show here is awe-inspiring. I've been hearing about the developers' conference, around 200 uh, companies, and next year, apparently, it's got to be a full day because of the level of interest. So um, there clearly is something incredibly exciting happening. Uh, personally, I'm sort of transported back to my days as a, a young graduate when I got my first job in television and I remember still that feeling of being just totally, totally blown away uh, by the, the level of creative energy that was just palpable at the time. I joined Central Television, which at the time uh, was quite a big, innovative company doing lots of exciting things, most of which have all been forgotten about now, of course. But actually, I don't feel so bad about that anymore because Graham told me that at Apple, um, any product that's older than six months is considered to be vintage. Um, so I'm much more relaxed about the fact uh, that uh, all these things have been consigned to room 101. Spitting Image, actually, is one of them. And I remember sort of walking around the sets of Spitting Image as a, as a young graduate. And uh, I just thought it was amazing. And I'd watched on the internal monitor them putting it together. It was so, so exciting, such a tremendous feeling. And uh, it's the same feeling that is evident here um, today. Um, but what I think is even more exciting is that whereas television has traditionally been a fairly exclusive world, how a girl from Grangemouth High got into it, I have absolutely no idea. Um, the IT industry seems to me to be much more open and much more accessible and offer opportunities for vast numbers of people from very, very diverse backgrounds. It's not completely caught up by Oxbridge, as unfortunately um, a lot of the world that I uh, am in is. Um, and I think that is tremendously exciting. It offers so many different opportunities in different areas, so much more open and democratic. Um, that is if you don't have a 13-year-old daughter. My daughter's 13, not 16, so I don't think her traffic is quite that um, heavy, Graham. But uh, I recently informed her, I decided I was going to embrace the new world, that I was going to set up a YouTube channel. Uh, and honestly, the look of horror on her face <laughs> was phenomenal. You'd think I would have said that I'm preparing a pole dancing routine for Britain's Got Talent. <laughs> it could not have been worse. She said, well, you can't. I said, well, why not? She's your old. <laughs> well, she might have a point. Um, anyway, I am going to take uh, advantage of this opportunity to see the future, and I know that you're going to do that too. Um, as Graham says, an incredible lineup of speakers, all leaders in their own field. 
Um, you do have the opportunity for questions. We're just going to sort of watch our time as we go through the day. Um, if you've got a burning question after a, a presentation, then please do shoot your hand up, and I'm sure we'll be able to accommodate you. But they're all going to come together at the end, and we're going to have 15 or 20 minutes there for you to be able to ask your your questions. So you might even sort of jot things down because you're going to get such a wealth of information over the next uh, hour and a half or so. But please, please do. Uh, don't miss out on this opportunity, soak up their knowledge and take the opportunity um, to pick their brains because, uh, as Polly says, that's why they're here, uh, having flown in from all parts of the globe. Uh, so, to our first speaker, um, Kimberly Blessing, who is the Director of Technology uh, Web Development at Think Brownstone, based in Philadelphia. Um, I caught a snatch conversation between her and Graham, and it would appear that in her spare time, she's also a bit of a karaoke queen, uh, but you might want to leave that for a conversation later on this evening. Um, for the moment, in the professional setting, Kimberly is going to address intrapreneurship, how to take entrepreneurship principles and apply them inside existing companies. So, uh, Kimberly, if you'd like to take the stage. Thank you. this moment at tech conferences where you kind of hope that your technology still works after you've walked away from it. This is one of those. Microsoft and Windows 10 had better not fail me now. Well, thank you so much for uh, being here today, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, when I got the invitation to come to Scotland, uh, I think a lot of people thought, it might be far to travel, are you sure you'd like to do it? And I just jumped at the opportunity. I love it here, and it's been great to be here for a few days and see uh, what's going on in, in the local economy when it comes to tech. So I have been uh, working in technology, software development, uh, web development uh, for over 20 years. And um, typically I think of myself as a technologist, uh, more of a nerd. Uh, but maybe it's because I am also somewhat of a systems thinker that I've become really interested in how business runs. Now I spent most of my career working within very large companies. Uh, I worked at America Online. I've worked at PayPal on the West Coast in Silicon Valley and then at Comcast, which is based in Philadelphia, and they're the US uh, leader in cable TV and internet uh, service um, for residential and business customers. Um, and so within these very large organizations, there are all sorts of challenges uh, that one encounters. And these large organizations uh, typically start out, obviously very small with a great idea, um, and then become these huge behemoths. Uh, and, and then they have to figure out how to uh, compete and keep up. Um, with, with the young upstarts. I guess it was about six or seven years ago that I was at a conference and somebody got up on stage and, and spoke about this concept of entrepreneurship and all of a sudden I, I had a name for what it was that I enjoyed doing most when I was at these large companies. So as a technologist, using my brain, my creative problem solving uh, uh, knowledge in order to tackle uh, the challenges that I saw, whether it be within, side the, within the organization or outside of the organization. So I hope that in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I'll be able to share with you what an entrepreneur is, inspire you to be one, maybe help you recognize whether or not you are already one. Um, and for the, the leaders who are here, uh, hopefully inspire you to want to grow more entrepreneurs within your organization so that your entire business can continue to grow. So let's uh, start off by talking about what an entrepreneur is. So an entrepreneur, not an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur is an employee. And this is where the technology doesn't want to work. There we go. An employee who's working within the constraints of the organization 
to affect change. That could be some sort of process-related change. It could be um, taking on uh, some type of, of new vertical or creating something new. And this could be an entirely new business unit um, or it could be something like a, a new feature for an existing product. And, and that change is going to yield significant business results or efficiencies. And maybe this is sometimes the key point. They're doing this without even being asked to do it. So this is the person who otherwise, uh, if they were not in your company, they'd probably be looking at what's happening in the world, identifying trends, connecting the dots, and they would perhaps be an entrepreneur, but because they work for you already, they want to make these changes and create these efficiencies inside of your organization. So I'm just curious, how many folks here hear that definition and, and that resonates with them? They think, hey, that's, that's me. I'm already that person. We get a couple of hands. Okay. Um, who would like to fit this description? A few folks. Okay. Now, for the leaders in the room, you already have some of these people within your company, very likely. Do you know who they are? So if you don't, you're probably going to want to go out and, and find out who they are. Now, this is particularly important, um, I think, at this point in time, and especially in talking to uh, an a group of people who are associated with the technology field and software organizations, because software is eating the world. Mark Andreessen, who was the founder of Netscape uh, back in 1994, wrote this piece about four years ago in the Wall Street Journal. And what he says very plainly is that there is no business today that doesn't completely run on software. Every business has become a software business. And it doesn't matter whether you're in automotive, whether you're in, you're in financial services, whether you're in healthcare, whether you're in energy. At the root of every single business today is software. And software is the way in which things are going to continue, these businesses will continue to grow and evolve and change. Companies need to leverage their technical experience, whether they already have it in-house or they need to grow it, they need to bring it in. Um, in order to drive that next generation of products, in order to improve on the touch points of the customer experience, um, and in order to obviously create new potential products. So chances are there are improvements you could be making today within your business, whether that be internal or external, that would make your business more responsive to customer demands or industry trends. So as I said, you could bring this talent from the outside in, or you can look to those who are already inside to help innovate. So let's talk a little bit about what it's like when you have these entrepreneurs already within the organization. So first of all, innovations, as I said, could be new products or processes, more efficient operational processes, cost-saving measures, that sort of thing. Because your employees already know your organization, they know your operations, they're well educated on the pain points that exist within your business, and they very likely already have great ideas on how to improve or change those things. They're also the ones who have the existing relationships with your customers, with your clients, with your partners. So they have the relationships to go out and seek feedback on those ideas, um, as well as to solicit new ideas and create new partnerships. All of that, of course, will lead to growth. And growth, of course, will help to diversify the business. And that growth itself can be diverse. It could be revenue, it could be profit. The company size could change. Influence within the industry certainly will change. And of course, everybody wants to work for a successful company. And if an individual knows that they're personally responsible for some of that growth, they're going to be increasingly engaged and committed to the, to the success of the company. And so entrepreneurship, in a way, is really growing the next leaders of your organization. Now, what happens when you have entrepreneurs that you're not aware of? 
that you don't take the time to engage with, well, those are the people who tend to get pretty grumpy, who may end up leaving the company. You hope they would leave the company because you certainly want, don't want them to dream dreams of revenge. That sounds like the worst case scenario. And of course, in the technology field where any given developer, software engineer, DevOps person, sysadmin has quite a lot of access probably to the core business, you definitely don't want them dreaming dreams of revenge. So Gifford Pinchot is the man who wrote uh, the, the first paper on entrepreneurship. Um, and so he knows quite a bit about this. Now he says that in any organization, you can expect that about 5% of the organization are what he would call natural innovators, people who just naturally identify opportunities um, and will try to make change. But that only one tenth of those natural innovators are in fact true entrepreneurs. I don't think that's necessarily true when it comes to the tech industry, only because most of the tech industry is made up of very creative, prob creative problem solvers. And so I think we've probably got a higher percentage of innovators and in entrepreneurs. So there's a lot of talent likely already in your organization that you could be taking advantage of. I think the thing that scares a lot of leaders when they think about entrepreneurship is what this means for the business. How can they contain this and control it and make sure it doesn't run away with uh, the overall focus of the business? So there are ways of thinking about introducing and managing entrepreneurship in your organization. And I like to put those into uh, the six sources of influence. So this is a, a, a grid system essentially that was created by um, the Vital Smarts team. So a, a number of gentlemen who paired up to uh, write a series of books. Uh, the most famous one in the US is Crucial Conversations. Um, but this one is about uh, change, sustaining change. And while the book is actually about personal success, uh, as soon as I read it, I, I realized that this type of uh, process can really be used in any size organization for pretty much any type of change that you're trying to create and manage. So you have this grid system here and, and what it speaks to is the fact that if you want to introduce change, you need to look at six different factors you have to look at personal factors, social factors, and structural factors. And within each of those, there's both a motivator as well as a need for an ability to do these things. So when it comes to personal motivation, you want to tap into the wants and desires of the individual, the, the intended entrepreneur. And when it comes to personal ability, you need to know that they have the skill set that is required in order to be an entrepreneur. So a brief example may be your organization is trying to adopt agile methodologies. In that particular case, you may have somebody who's already passionate about it um, and who wants to do it for their own career growth, but you need to probably make sure that they've been to Scrum Master training before you, you try to put them in a position to help roll out um, any kind of process change. Along the social uh, spectrum, when it comes to social motivation, it helps to let entrepreneurs build their own team. Don't assign them people or resources. Let them identify what it is that they think they need in order to get the job done. And when it comes to social ability, because you'll likely find that you have multiple entrepreneurs within your organization, bring them all together and create a cohort so that they can speak to one another, share information and ideas, uh, support one another, give each other feedback. And then finally, along that structural spectrum, structural motivation would likely include giving them a platform to share their ideas. This could be uh, allowing them the opportunity to get up on stage and present to the company once their idea is ready to be shared with everyone, or it could be as, as small as giving them time with the CEO in order to talk about what they're doing. And speaking of speaking with the CEO, in order to provide that structural ability, you'll want to make sure that they have some sort of sponsor 
or executive who's going to give them feedback and support, who's going to keep them accountable and on track with what they're doing. So once you take a look at all of those different factors, all of a sudden entrepreneurship starts to seem like a possibility within most organizations. Uh, it's not necessarily so scary, and it seems like something that could be managed and well contained. Um, and when I say managed, I mean both from a uh, time perspective and from a cost perspective. So what I want to share with you now are just a few ways in which I've seen this executed uh, in, uh, in businesses in the U.S. Um, and these are two uh, very different, I think, examples. So the first one is what I would call crowdsourcing. Um, so at Comcast, again, I, I used to work for Comcast, uh, we had this thing that we called Lab Week. Um, Lab Week, I'll, I'll describe what we have going on here. Lab Week started on the Friday uh, before Lab Week. On the left-hand side, you can see here, there are about probably 200 people organized in one of the town halls within uh, the facility in Philadelphia. And this is what's called Pitch Day. So anybody uh, who has an idea for a project can get up during a, a very long luncheon in which uh, pizza is provided and present their, their particular idea. And sometimes these are new products or new features for existing products. Sometimes it's just, I wanna learn a new technology. Sometimes it's, this has nothing to do with our business, but let's just go out and uh, hack some hardware or let's try to do something for uh, a local nonprofit. Um, so there's a very wide range of ideas that get presented on pitch day. And the rest of the afternoon, uh, people start messaging each other from all over the company and they form teams. And so when they come in on the Monday of the following week, they now have their project team, they finalize their idea, and they have up until noon on Friday in order to build that thing. And so as of Friday at noon, and what you can see on the right hand side there is a science fair. So each team has stakes out space somewhere in the building and sets up whatever it is that they've done and they give presentations for the rest of the afternoon. And at some point, the executives within the company come by and get to directly see what they've been doing, ask questions. And I personally have seen teams of people get tapped on the shoulder right then and there and they're told, all right, next Monday you're reporting to this other location. This is gonna be a real project. We're gonna figure out how to take you off of your other work. Um, I've seen some teams where they present an idea and someone's walked by and said, you know what? We need to figure out how to get this into a future release. Let's start putting some, some meetings on the calendar and get that going. Um, one of the people who's in the picture on the left-hand side is, is a friend of mine, and she had an idea back in uh, 2001, excuse me, 2011, uh, to create a service using the Twitter APIs that would allow you to remotely program your DVR. So opening up a, a potential opportunity for uh, targeted ads on Twitter to advertise a particular television show where all somebody would have to do from their Twitter account is click a button and it would automatically program uh, their DVR to record that show. And that particular feature was announced by Twitter in 2013. So a lot of these things do become um, real projects or, or real uh, uh, products and features. The difference between something like this and what you commonly hear about in Silicon Valley where folks may have 15% time or 20% time, uh, an individual developer who has 15% time or 20% time, uh, in my experience, is very likely to spend that time alone. This is intended and is, is always executed as a group activity. You usually get very cross-functional teams. You'll have folks from the UX organization working with engineers, working with product teams, working with QA. Sometimes they'll even be interfacing directly with customer service. And so that cross-collaboration tends to very rapidly generate um, some very good minimum viable products that have uh, a direct uh, business benefit. I should also point out, this happens three times a year uh, which ends up being about the equivalent of six or seven percent time. So you're not over investing from uh, a time or financial perspective um, and, and you've got it uh, well time boxed. 
So this is, as I said, one type of approach, bringing everybody together and, and managing it. Um, what happened at PayPal, and this happened at PayPal after I left, um, this is a slightly different story because this is a story of the head of PayPal going to directly one engineering manager saying, I want you to go do this. I believe in you and the ideas that you've been espousing, make this happen. So when I worked at PayPal uh, back in 2006 through two th 2008, one of the biggest challenges that we had was hiring software engineers. The back end was a, a C system, and in order to actually render the front end, um, developers were writing this thing called PML. It was PayPal markup language. Why use an industry standard when you can create your own and force people to spend six months learning it before they can be productive on the job? And I'm not kidding. It took at least six months to be productive on the job. So therein lies one really obvious benefit of getting rid of, of a system like that. Um, it was hard to hire because you couldn't bring in folks who already uh, had the skills to hit the ground running. Um, but it was also really hard to retain talent because most people knew that they were learning something proprietary that wasn't going to advance them overall in their career. Fast forward to, uh, I think about 2009, 2010, Bill Scott, who had been at Netflix and was responsible for a good deal of their uh, approach to building a UI that could render on 400 plus devices, um, Bill Scott joined PayPal and again be began to talk about this idea of uh, you know, a pattern library uh, coming up with a better user interface. And in order to uh, realize that this old C system really had to go by the wayside. In fact, in the intervening time, um, PayPal had migrated off of C and onto Java. And then in order to write any HTML, you had to write Java which was not much of an improvement. Um, Bill was given eight weeks and three additional resources, I believe he said, in order to figure out how to completely transform the way web development was being done at PayPal. And so he looked around and picked up tools that were going to be in easy to integrate with that Java stack. Um, he went with a Node.js based solution um, and within eight weeks was able to uh, build enough of the overall checkout system to demo it for the leadership, which then fueled uh, a lot of excitement on that platform, and he got the full backing to then start to transform the entire organization. And so this is now, it's called Kraken.js. Um, that's why it's PayPal releasing the Kraken. Uh, so the system's called Kraken. It's open source, so another side benefit is that uh, PayPal can uh, make it really easy to, to hire folks now. Their system's open source. If somebody wants to apply for a job there, they can say, go read up on all of the documentation before you come for your interview. And so now you have a completely different context for, uh, for learning and growing, as well as for attracting people. Uh, a lot of folks in Silicon Valley uh, are energized by the idea of contributing to open source platforms. So it has a, an additional side benefit. So in this case, somebody being directly tapped, uh, being recognized as an entrepreneur and being told to go off and do something versus sort of that crowdsourcing approach that Comcast had. Now, if you have your doubts, I, I don't blame you. It takes a long time for innovation to, uh, to really break into the way that we all think of the world. And so, in fact, this has been studied uh, by Everett Rogers. He wrote about the diffusion of innovation. Um, and, and what you can see here is that an idea, a process, a technology um, tends to be adopted in waves or in, in different phases. And so the innovators, the first 2.5% of people who get interested in, in that thing um, or who believe in that idea, they're obviously the very, very uh, small minority at the beginning and it's hard for them to convince others. Um, but they do in time start to convince others and then you get the early adopters. And so when it comes to talking about entrepreneurship, we might still be in that, that early adopter phase. Maybe we're just hitting that early majority phase. Um, 
as that red line tends at, goes trends upwards, so as more people adopt the idea of entrepreneurship, that red line will continue to increase. And that's basically going to uh, bring us to a point where we have enough people doing it and enough people who are aware of it and believe in it that then it should tip the scales and pretty soon it's going to be the way that all organizations operate. Um, but it may not be something that is uh, quite prime time yet. So prime time would be once we get that late majority. But you also don't want to wait because if you wait for too long, you may miss out on the opportunities uh, that are afforded to you by the people who are part of your business now. You certainly wouldn't want them to go elsewhere and uh, start up new businesses or influence your competitors. So there are a few ways to get started with this. I'll, I'll give you a few ideas. Particularly if you're a tech company, not trying to make some other type of sector into a tech company. Easy things to look at are the user experience for your product, how you can reduce time to market, likely through DevOps and agile methodologies. You can look at organizational and operational efficiencies. Perhaps this is gained by computing in the cloud. Um, and then, of course, there are all sorts of R&D opportunities that your tech folks will, will likely be aware of. But again, don't just look to the tech teams. Involve everyone in the company in this process. What that cross-functional uh, discipline will start to um, help new ideas come to the forefront. There are some really great books uh, on this particular topic or that relate to this topic. And you've probably seen one or both of these before. So Lean Enterprise is all about how organizations can innovate at scale. Uh, there are a number of exercises that are in this book that I've found to be particularly uh, useful when bringing together a team for the first time. Uh, I tend to work with, uh, as a consultant now, I tend to work with companies that are sometimes a little hesitant to trust the folks that they have um, already in-house. Uh, so here I am, I'm a consultant saying, don't bother going to a consultant, talk to the people you already have. Uh, this is what I try to do in my job. I go into an organization and I want to talk to the people who do a particular job day in and day out. They're the ones who are gonna have the ideas and I just wanna help magnify those and bring attention to them. Um, and some of the exercises that are in Lean Enterprise are really wonderful for either storyboarding ideas or brainstorming ideas. Um, that can really help transform an organization. The other book, The Phoenix Project, is really about the transformation of, of IT um, within a non-technology business. But again, it really could be about um, pretty much any industry at this point, including an IT-related business. Um, and so it's about the introduction of dev, dev operations and the partnerships that need to be formed between the project management organization or product management organization, uh, engineering, um, operations, uh, all the way through finance um, and leadership. So I encourage you to check those out. This is the third time I think I've seen this quotation today. Um, so there were two dev talks this morning where I saw this. So um, Grace Hopper is very popular. Um, she's quoted as saying the most dangerous phrase in the language is, we've always done it this way. The technology industry did not look anything like this 10 years ago. It barely existed 30 to 40 years ago. We're already doing things differently. And if we want to continue to innovate and grow our businesses, uh, the only way to do it is through change. Um, and so it's, it's in, in trusting uh, the folks in your organizations already that you're going to be able to grow your businesses. And all these entrepreneurs, honestly, are looking for an exchange uh, for, for this trust is a little bit of freedom. Oh, crap, sorry. Okay, um, we'll go with that freedom instead. <laughs> Wrong audience. Um, but in reality, entrepreneurship, in a way, is about creating a revolution inside of your organization. Um, as Kay said, I'm from Philadelphia. We know a little bit about revolution in Philadelphia. There was one that started there about 250 years ago. Um, and that spirit 
it's interesting, it runs through the tech industry in Philadelphia today um, as well. There's something about empowering individuals that helps you to maximize not only their individual happiness, but obviously grows your business and uh, the profit involved. I just want to take this opportunity to say that if you trust, things will grow and your organization will change for the better. So I hope that I've inspired you a bit to look for those entrepreneurs in your organization. Um, and I'll be around for the rest of the day if anybody's interested in chatting about this. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Kimberly. We probably do have a, a couple of minutes now if anyone would like to, to put forward some questions at this stage. I must admit, I was really, just put your hand up if you, if you do. Um, I was really intrigued when you started off your presentation, Kimberly, and you said that you know big companies need to look out for keeping up with small companies. And it, it occurred to me, well, is that not the wrong way around? Because usually small companies are looking to big companies. Um, so as companies are growing, would you advise then that they are aware of being able to continue to encourage this uh, spirit of innovation? Absolutely. I mean, a large company can't take its eye off the ball for a moment. And I think we've seen a, a number of large companies who have done that. Um, I ju was just reading about the, the breakup of HP last night. Uh, you know, some companies do- Because Blackberry would be another obvious- Blackberry is another yeah. great example. You know, they, they believe that they can't fail, uh, that they're too big to fail. And in fact, what ends up happening is that they don't even know what's going on around them. And before they know it, somebody else has picked up where they left off and run off with, with their customers. Yeah, but presumably you have to be anticipating that before you become that big company, yeah? Can you do that or not? Uh, I, I think you can change. Um, you know, the, the Phoenix Project book is, again, a great example of, uh, it's, of course, a fairy tale uh, in a lot of ways, but I think it is possible to take a very um, uh, old organization that may be set in its ways and force it to change. A lot of it's going to have to do with influencing the, the leadership um, and helping them see the opportunities. Um, you know, it is about confronting some fear, uh, but I think the bigger fear is in letting things continue as, as they are and, and yeah. potentially no longer, you know, having that, that number one spot. Yeah, rather than a unicorn, you become a dodo. Exactly. Which is not a good thing. Um, are there any questions just now? I mean, it did occur to me at the beginning when you said your hands up, but you, who's an entrepreneur? Do you have entrepreneurs in your company? There wasn't a lot. Graham was one of the few people who put their hand up. In fact, you, you put your hand up as well, didn't you? Mine's audible. Um, fascinating talk. Thank you very much. I, I started in a process innovation department uh, rather longer ago than I would like to say, and uh, very much what you were talking about. I think one of the questions I had with, with your experience in particular is what kind of leadership and management culture do you find, I imagine that you probably have a little checklist that says, oh dear, this is gonna be very difficult, or, oh, you know, we're, we're in the right space here. Uh, and it's just perhaps you have some insight into what that checklist would be for you in terms of, you know, this is positive and, oh, we've got something to address here. Uh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, so at, at Comcast, the uh, executive who actually authorized the Lab Week system, um, I think was one of the people that we thought would never back such an idea. Um, I think he understood the risk of losing people. Um, so we were one of the organizations that somehow had managed to have very little attrition uh, versus the rest of the company. Uh, and I, he, I think he was mostly focused on maintaining that particular number. Um, I think he was also very interested in diversity and growing uh, the diversity of his overall team. Uh, so this was a relatively little investment in his eyes. Um, and I think he really just kind of ignored what we did during that time period, honestly, until the other executives came around and started patting him on the back saying, hey, you know, your folks have some really great ideas. Um, certainly, uh, when, I, when I was at PayPal, interestingly, they thought they were incredibly innovative and yet trying to explain that one of the biggest problems with hiring was this very old technical stack. Um, 
they just felt like, no, there's, there's no reason to change this. You know, people need to change if they want to come work for us because we're the best. Yet at the same time, they, uh, they definitely evangelized other skunk work projects, um, but those were mostly around you know, finding new product opportunities, not so much around the operational efficiencies. So I think it, it's a matter of getting to know the leadership team, the executive team, and understanding what might connect with them, looking for opportunities that will align with that first as a, a means of creating some goodwill and demonstrating how entrepreneurship can be successful. And then you know, starting to, to open the doors from there. Um, there. There's a frequent saying in, in a lot of the entrepreneurship material that says, you know, fly below the radar for as long as you possibly can. You know, basically don't tell people what you're doing until you absolutely have to. Um, you know, and then of course Grace Hopper comes along and, and always has wonderful quotations and she always talks about it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. And so sometimes all of these things may be true, um, that maybe that's where that little bit of revolutionary spirit comes into play. Uh, I think that you know, most of the people that I've ever worked with, you just give them a little bit, you feed them and you kind of nudge them and say, I think we can do this, let's, let's try to do this on you know, the off hours, on our lunch breaks, you know, on the coffee break. Um, and before you know it, you've got enough excitement that people really do want to invest in it. Um, and then you get it to a point where you're so proud of it, you can't contain it anymore and you want to share. Uh, and so at that point, um, hopefully when you, when you do share, you're sharing with the right people, the right executives, and then they are being responsive to what you're, you're doing. Good stuff. Any other questions just now? I mean, Kimberly will come back at the end so we can continue this conversation later on. Um, Kimberly, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you Kay.